uh, machine learning governance, um, which is the topic here. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Mason. I'm an ML engineer at ThoughtWorks. Uh, my role is also a consultant role, uh, and I help our client deliver uh, usually ML solutions from proof of concept uh, to production, but I also focus on uh, platform modernization or anything infrastructure. Um, great. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're ready to start. Uh, so, yeah, there's lots of discussions of ML governance, um, and it's quite a uh, hot topic to be talking about, but um, quite a number of these discussions never really get into the details. Uh, so it can be quite a confusing topic to uh, try to learn. Well, we're going to try and break through the confusion here, and we can explain how you can really do something about ML governance and how to do something at the level of the data science team. This is going to involve talking about documentation. Um, with techies, documentation uh, can be uh, not a very popular topic, but the documentation that we're going to talk about here is good documentation. It's the kind of documentation that can really help you out if you use it widely, uh, wisely. So, uh, yeah, let's get started and see what we need to discuss in order to understand ML governance. So first up, why is this topic so confusing? Uh, why is ML governance such a confusing topic? Why do so many people feel like they don't even know what ML governance even is? The fact is that many teams right now have very little governance. This is understandable as technologists have a de delivery focus, uh, which means that uh, teams are biased towards building solutions now and worrying about risks later. Uh, to get to a better place on governance, the burden, though, can't all be on technologists to put that governance in place. It has to be a collaborative process. Now, when I talk about a collaborative process, this can make techies kind of nervous. Um, and this can be, I think the re reason this makes people nervous is that the people don't really know what's needed. And there's a fear that somebody outside of the team is going to come in and start telling the team what they can and can't do. Um, now, this nervousness, I think, is then amplified by confusion about what's really needed. It's understandable that we get confused about ML governance. There's lots of different aspects, and it's easy to get lost in the conversations. There's hot topics like responsible AI that gets lots of attention. Um, and then there's more down-to-earth kind of uh, nuts and bolts topics like uh, ML ops. But each of these is just a part of the overall ML governance picture. We could roughly cluster different aspects of ML governance under three big areas, ethics and principles, tech practices and ML ops, and management and frameworks. This helps us get a better picture of ML governance, but it only takes us so far. We'll get into the details very shortly, but just first to re-emphasize the point that uh, I've already mentioned, which is that um, this talk is not going to be a responsible AI talk. Ethics and responsible AI are important topics, but they're only part of the ML governance conversation. We want to talk about the boring side of ML governance. Um, yeah, so we also need to think about uh, the relative weight or importance of the topics under ML governance. Uh, when people think about ML governance, they tend to think about uh, ethics, responsible AI, like Ryan just mentioned, and it is a big part of ML governance, uh, but uh, there's also another part which is around documentation, sign off, and things that people tend to consider as bureaucracy and not rather get involved with. And we really want to shift this thinking in this talk. And instead of uh, thinking about documentation, peer review as part of a best practice, we want this to be uh, reinforced uh, by good governance. And we don't really want uh, sign off to be about begging someone uh, to tick a box next to your model. It should be really about uh, positioning risk trade-off decisions uh, with the right people. 
Um, it's also worth understanding how ML governance relates to other types of governance and especially data governance, because uh, there is an important overlap between uh, both and it, they're usually going to be set up by similar archetypes and people. Uh, the main areas of overlaps are in documenting data sets, so where the data set comes from, what it means, how it gets updated, its known uh, limitation. And data documentation is needed both for data and ML governance, and ideally, it would fall under data governance so that data scientists can leverage, uh, let, leverage um, the data documentation. Because it's not only needed for uh, producing ML model, but it's also do, uh, needed for doing data analysis, analytics dashboard, and generally asking questions of uh, data. Uh, there's also data labeling, which likewise has a lot of um, value for data analysis and non-machine learning applications. And there's also data lineage, which is about tracking changes to the data over time. This can be important for ML training pipelines and reproducibility. But once again, there are also data analytics use cases where uh, data lineage can be important. And sometimes this can even be a requirement for uh, auditors and uh, regulated uh, industries. So let's talk about how to come up with the ML governance process. Um, and these are the kind of questions we want, um, we are going to talk about. So first of all, how much documentation is appropriate? So uh, documentation can be boring, but more specifically when they are too much. So we want to understand how to be more concise and how to produce good documentation, uh, whether we should have manual sign-offs, and if so, when and who should perform them, what are the types of roles and what would be their responsibilities in the sign-off. Um, when there is an escalation that's needed for higher risks, um, risks uh, when is it needed, and what should the governance board do in these cases? And what if you are in a regulated industry and how can MLOps help? And most importantly, what is the point of all this governance and how much is too much? Uh, so these questions help you uh, understand how to come up with a ML governance framework. And the first question is how much is too much? Uh, processes can easily be over-engineered and manual checks uh, can slow down the process and can uh, be harder to follow and, and keep track which can really just affect the team morale. Uh, simply referring to a process or a documentation style as a best practice isn't enough to make us trust this. It might just be bureaucracy rebranded. Um, so for a team to be comfortable with the process, um, it has to be relevant and appropriate. Uh, this is a bit of a side note, but the terms bureaucracy really truly means rules by, rule by desk. And when you are constrained by bureaucracy, it does feel like you're at uh, the mercy of something and thinking. Uh, however, it's important to note that when, uh, when this feeling arises and when rules don't work well uh, for your case or your team, like you can't get done what you want to get done because somebody has made a rule without thinking of how it would impact uh, what you want to do. Uh, in these cases, processes and rules are not the problem, but the problem is when the rules and processes don't fit, uh, what needs to be done. Uh, so I'll hand over to Ryan, who's going to talk you through an actionable view of ML governance. So now we know what ML governance is about, but how do we make it happen? This slide here is going to look super simple. Um, but uh, we should pause on this and take it in carefully. It's not the whole answer to ML governance, but it is a starting point that we'll use in this presentation. You can think of this slide as a flexible template for a process that can be adapted for different organizations and teams. The flow hinges around certain key documents that you can see here named as the model card, the model validation report, and model owner approval. But the flow is not just about producing good documentation. It's also about facilitating informed decision making and positioning decisions with the most appropriate people. So at the start of this flow, the model developer produces a model card. And the model card documents the purpose of a model, its design, what data it uses, what risks the model developer can see around the model, and also advice on how the model should and should not be used. This is then checked by the model validator. The model validator will check that the model is reproducible, 
and that the code and documentation is clear. There might be some back and forth here between the model developer and the model validator. We can think of it like a pull request review process. There might be a separate model validation report uh, that uh, is distinct from the model card. Or it might be that the model validator adds a section uh, into the model card. Uh, and this uh, model validation report then becomes part of the model card. Or it might even be that the uh, model uh, developer creates a pull request and the model validator adds structured comments to that pull request. So it might be part of a pull request review process. The next step then is the model owner uh, or it resides with the model owner. The model owner is much like the validator looking for clarity about how the model works and how it should be used and its limitations. But the model owner is quite different from the model validator in that they won't be technical. So this needs to be explained at a different level. This dialogue will probably mean some more back and forth on the documentation. Uh, most importantly, the model owner needs to know about any risks and trade-offs associated with the model, as the model owner will be responsible at business level for both the model uh, as a um, code artifact and also uh, for the model as a um, piece of a business product or process in which it is to be used. Actually, the, that's probably the key part, is the model owner will be re responsible for the, the role of the model within the business process, um, more so than the technical aspect, which might receive, sit with a technical authority. So within this process, there might also be an escalation route to an oversight board. Not every organization will have an oversight board, but for organizations that do have an oversight board, then the board would become involved in cases where a model is identified as high risk. And this would trigger a deeper review with more parties involved. Some factors that could trigger an oversight review uh, could be use of sensitive data or attributes, such as um, personally identifiable information or protected attributes such as gender. Um, uh, another trigger point could be if the model is making decisions that have a potentially negative impact on an individual or uh, a entity such as a company. Um, so further, Reasons for doing a review might be if there are, say, security concerns raised by an independent security review, or if there are questions about the quality of the model or the level of monitoring that is um, possible to put in place or that has been chosen to be put in place for the model. Uh, an oversight board might also lead to um, a periodic review process. Now, this could happen on, say, an annual basis, so once a year, or it might be at some other frequency. Uh, there might be an um, external auditor, uh, and that could be a reason for driving this kind of review process, but it might be, it's probably easier to understand this process if you think of it first uh, in terms of non-regulated industries where there's no external auditor. And we can think about regulated industries separately. Now, you, you might do an internal audit to check that documentation is all up to a similar standard. Uh, and you might also use that documentation to look for patterns and opportunities within the organization. Um, say, if there's uh, particular areas in the organization that you can see that um, uh, they could benefit from like collaborating with a, a different part of the org where they, the skills are perhaps up to a different standard or the documentation is up to a different standard. Uh, there's a lot to understand here, so let's try to make it more concrete. We'll get into the details of model cards and understand what a model validator or model owner would be looking for. But first, let's understand the roles in more detail. So uh, in ML governance, uh, we want to place the right kind of questions, uh, decisions, responsibility with the appropriate role. Uh, it's really about accountability, who's accountable for which step in your ML governance. Uh, framework. Uh, too often what we're seeing is that uh, data scientists are assumed to have already assessed risks and dealt with them so that product management or the model owner here 
um, and other business managers don't really have to think about them. But this is not necessarily appropriate as uh, data scientists are not necessarily empowered to make uh, decisions about what risks are worth taking and are not simply able to make these risks go away. Um, data scientists are in a position to develop uh, the model, to explain what they do, and make the risks and trade-offs of the model clear. Uh, data scientists are also in a position to advise on what monitoring will be appropriate for running models in production. Uh, the, the model or product owner is in a position actually to um, understand which risks are worth taking in terms of their product and what mitigations are worth the extra time and effort. And the governance board is in a position to sign off on serious risks uh, and ask uh, more sensitive questions. We also spoke about the, the model validator. Uh, there may be more than one model validator with different intention. The first assumption is that the model validator will be a fellow data scientist. And this is necessary in order to check the robustness uh, of the development process, ba basically making sure that uh, the experiments or the model are repeatable, robust, and uh, accurate. There may also be an ML engineer or support engineer similar or similar archetype, um, and they will know all the background to monitor the model in life. Um, ideally, the model developer and an ML engineer will work together to put together a deployment uh, and monitoring plan uh, that also needs to be part of the extended model card. Uh, the mo uh, model card is a documentation uh, style we'll uh, present in a bit, um, as the model owner needs to know about um, uh, the deployment plan. They need to know about any deployment risks and what kind of monitoring is achievable as it is part of the overall risk profile. So uh, I just spoke about model cards. So what are the different styles of documentation around uh, machine learning models uh, and how do they actually look like and what purpose do they serve? Um, so there's been a lot of discussion of about how to best document ML models. And we've listed the most notable approaches to ML um, governance here. Uh, model cards are a checklist that Google is trying to popularize uh, and they're focused on overviews and design trade-offs of the model. So I'm gonna be showing you what a, a model card looks like. Uh, this is a model card for a model that's trying to predict 3D facial uh, surface geometry. Uh, the model is a conv uh, convolutional neural network. These are the different specification of its architecture the inputs that it takes, so it takes image input and the outputs um, that it returns, as we can see here. Uh, in the model card, you have the authors, uh, any sort of citation, whether it's from a paper. Uh, you also have uh, intended uses. Uh, so what's interesting here is they've specified which applications um, this model can be used for and which are out of scope application. So this model can be used to detect human facial surface geometry, uh, but is not appropriate for like human life critical decision. Uh, and it does not really provide facial recognition or identification. Um, it also has limitations that are made clear in this uh, model card. Uh, it gives the trade-offs. For instance, this model is optimized uh, for real-time performance on a wide variety of mobile devices but it is sensitive uh, to face position and scale uh, in the input image, meaning if the input is not a uh, very good quality, you might not get uh, the same level of accuracy. Uh, it also gives uh, the factors and subgroups about uh, the different attributes and group this model was trained on. Um, it also gives the model performance measures that were used, the evaluation modes um, and data sets, uh, the data sets and the results uh, of the evaluation here. And what's interesting is they've added uh, a fairness test and they use specific fairness criteria and provided the fairness results here in the model card. Um, and this is basically all of the different details that the data scientist or model developer uh, deemed important to be documented so that uh, there's no context loss and people can refer back to this model card. Uh, we've also have um, data sheets, which are kind of a checklist for data sets and not for a model. Uh, so they're complementary. Model cards and data sheets both started from a position of reducing misuse, uh, mistakes, and biases. 
but we also have reproducibility checklists, which started from a different angle. The motivation for uh, reproducibility checklists was more about ensuring the robustness um, of uh, the results being reported for ML model, especially in research papers. So making sure someone can reproduce an academic uh, research model. Another angle for checklists is uh, production readiness. Uh, we have ML test scores uh, for production readiness, which really address deployment and infrastructure and also elements aimed at, ML, at the ML model, such as ensuring that the code is reviewed and that the uh, code is in Git, that the hyperparameters are tuned and that the model chosen is as simple as it can be without loss of performance. So there's so many angles to ML documentation and it's clear that we need to cover a mixture of different concerns uh, in documenting ML models. So we might choose to do this in one uh, single checklist like in the uh, model card, uh, but we uh, might also choose to do it in a range of different sections or uh, like a, or a variety of checklists. Um, the, the ML cards for uh, DevOps MLOps governance uh, and, or data MLOps governance by Ian Hellstorm uh, suggest that it's better to use uh, separate cards or checklists for different concerns, um, but um, it's up to the team. Uh, so we presented a variety of purposes of uh, model cards. Um, the key takeaway here is to, we're trying to understand under what conditions does the model perform best and most consistently. Um, we really want to give an internal uh, and especially limitation of the model and uh, intended and unintended applications. And it's really an open documentation format, not a process. So it's focused more uh, on the model rather than the data. So that's model cards. And that's the central piece in the process that we've talked about before. Actually, you could simply extend the model card concept and treat the three documents from this slide as one big model card. Maybe the model validator then just provides feedback that updates the model card. Maybe the model owner approval could uh, be recorded also on the model card. That's kind of up to you um, if you want to do it that way. Um, it's, it's an option. Now, this whole process can sound easy when you talk it through in a presentation. Uh, the difficult thing is making it work for a particular team. There are lots of difficult questions that you hit when you try to introduce a process like this in a real team. For example, should the model validator be from a different team, or can it, the model validator be from the same team as a model developer? Um, see, a, a, set, a different team provides more independence and reduces the risk of uh, sort of biased reviewing. Uh, but it also requires that, that uh, you get time from a different team and you risk getting people that don't know the context. Um, you have uh, questions also like say, where do the model cards live? Where are you actually gonna put all this documentation? Who updates and maintains the cards? Um, so you might, that's, you know, one thing is producing the cards in the first place, but once, you, once the model actually goes live, what about all the updates to it or when you make changes? Uh, does the validator need to fully reproduce the model and its results? Um, reproducibility for machine learning can be quite an arduous uh, undertaking. So uh, there is a question about whether that's uh, an adequate return on investment for spending that time on every model. Um, um, when it comes to the uh, model owner review, how much of the responsibility of this phase is on the model developer to explain about the model as opposed to on the model owner to ask the right questions to bring out the key concerns and risks. When the model does go live, who will be responsible for monitoring that model once it, in the live environment? And then you've got questions about the governance board, like who should even be on this governance board? <clears throat> Answering these questions tends to depend a lot on the context of the team and the organization you have to talk to people and figure out what everyone will be comfortable with. Making the process work for a team isn't just about talking to people either. There's also documentation that shows what the process is about, and that's super important. There should be reference examples for the documentation, example model cards that show models that make sense for the team. 
These reference examples will have a big impact on what documentation really gets produced, because from these examples, uh, developers will be able to see what kind of detail is expected. Talking to people and producing uh, reference documentation is valuable um, and key steps in the process, but it's also not enough in itself. You should test out a new process and get feedback and keep adjusting it. Um, now, adjusting the process um, it's, itself, it can be a process, and initially that's quite an intensive process. Um, you would keep adjusting it until it's proven and to a certain extent that's true but then the adjustment never kind of totally ends um a, a process like this is likely to be a living process that you would want to adjust as the organization um changes over time now this slide is offering just a sort of general um piece of advice a small piece of general advice about shaping and governance process uh, you do somehow have to decide about how much documentation detail is too much and how many sign-offs are too many. There is no general right answer. Firstly, you have to look at your risks and get a sense for what realistically might go wrong and what the implications could be. Then you should work with your team and shape the process together. This kind of approach ensures that everyone feels included and buys into the process. We're coming to the end of the presentation now, so we want to leave you with a key thought. ML governance is about lots of things like best practice and communication. Um, but for many organizations, the really big thing that they need to tackle is risk management. Here on this slide is a useful picture to keep in mind for risk management. We have to be wary of doing our risk assessments in a superficial way. It's tempting to focus on specific risks or specific types of risk and then not look really for the other types of risk. The format of the documentation should help practitioners to go through risks in a methodical and balanced way. Otherwise, you can get bitten. Let's make this concrete by looking at a famous case of getting bitten by risks in using machine learning. There are lots of these, but one that illustrates the point well is when Apple Card launched in 2019. Its credit assessments at that point were immediately accused of gender bias. Lots of high profile people were critical, including Apple founder Steve Wozniak and uh, Ruby on Rails creator David Heinemeyer Hansen. The credit assessment service was operated by Goldman Sachs, and they were quick to say that they were not using gender as an attribute. So then there was speculation that maybe gender was entering indirectly through other attributes. This can happen as some occupations have big gender bias. Uh, so if um, occupation is used as part of the training data for the uh, model, then um, you can cre indirectly create bias uh, that's a, a gender bias. In fact, an investigation from the New York State Department for um, Financial Services found that there was actually no gender bias in the model, despite what the um, high profile critics were suggesting. The problem was actually that people didn't understand the logic. Uh, there were complaints that uh, female spouses were getting lower limits, uh, lower credit limits. And uh, this was getting questioned in a high profile way on the basis that um, these couples uh, had shared assets and income. <clears throat> now. Um, in many countries, uh, uh, shared income doesn't make sense, but in the US, um, you really can have shared income. So if you file a joint tax return, then um, you, you do have shared income for all intents and purposes. But um, while income and assets can be shared, um, there's a, another key element that's not shared, and that's uh, credit history. Uh, and that was actually part of the algorithm uh, and did explain many of these discrepancies. Uh, or counterintuitive results. Where the New York State Department for Financial Services so did criticize Goldman Sachs uh, when in the operation of Apple Card was that um, uh, Goldman didn't really provide very good communication or customer response. When these high profile complaints were being made, Goldman had no way to respond to all the complaints and wasn't able at the time to explain why the credit scores were coming out the way that they were. 
Now, you can imagine this might have been overlooked or just not prioritized, perhaps uh, due to the rush to get the Apple Card service live. Um, presumably, people were thinking, oh, let's just make sure it's working and doing the right thing. Being able to explain why it's doing the right thing might have seen as sort of a day two thing. Uh, but it actually caused you know, significant reputational damage. And uh, in retrospect, maybe uh, that might, might not have been the best choice. Uh, so um, I think we're ready to wrap this up now so we can summarize. Um, ML governance is a multifaceted um, space or um, challenge. Um, um, because it has so many different aspects, it can be confusing to get to grips with. Um, um, uh, but it's important to get to grips with, grips with it because uh, otherwise the um, uh, you can get into big trouble over the risks that are associated with ML models. Um, we've provided here a simple template process uh, that can, or template for a way to structure a process. And this template is based around model cards and a clearly defined set of roles. Uh, the model owner role or product owner role is actually key to uh, model or ML risk management. And the key takeaway, it needs to be shaped by your team or it can fall into, fall into bureaucracy. So uh, being lean and iterating over a process and getting regular feedback from all the team is, is key. Uh, so great, uh, we can open now for questions. Uh, I will share the documentation um, links on the chat. Uh, so are there any open source tools to assess fairness of the model? Um, so Shapley analysis is um, a way to start with explainability uh, and can it's kind of open source, So, you, but it's not necessarily just for fairness. Usually each cloud provider also provide a range of different framework around uh, fra um, fairness, but I guess fairness starts with trying to understand the business case. So speaking to your product person and identifying, I guess, which features might be sensitive and then checking whether uh, the model is making, is using certain, like some features appear more important than others, but shouldn't. And that you can achieve with Chapley analysis. Do you wanna add anything to this? Slide? Uh no, I'm just, uh, I guess, it's, um, as Mason was saying, the uh, fairness is so context specific that uh, um, I'd be surprised if there's a good way to automate those kinds of um, checks that need to be done. Um, Great. I don't think we have uh, any more questions. I've just linked all of the links on the deck. Um, and we'll be sharing the recording with the event organizing. Thank you all for joining. Bye. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the nice feedback as well.